Uh, good morning to all. Uh, it is our immense pleasure to welcome you all, the, all on the uh, second half of uh, FTP on purely the fundamentals of mechanical engineering, uh, initiated by uh, Chennai Institute of Technology under the Knowledge 4.0 webinar series. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Uh, Yan Shivashan Mugam, Associate Professor, Mary Dishapalli, uh, my guru. I welcome you, sir, for this wonderful occasion. And uh, good morning, uh, the Sar is, Sar is going to uh, talk about the fundamentals of synth materials. Uh, so, as, as, far, uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned, uh, Sar is the uh, one who is offering the uh, synth material courses in the NIT uh, for a long time. So, uh, his lecture uh, will be highly, highly useful to enhance your fundamentals knowledge and which will in turn help you to uh, go for a good classroom teaching and will enhance something at the search. And uh, now uh, let me uh, request um, uh, Ms. Varsas, uh, Mrs. Soprasri to introduce our sir. Good morning, everyone. Myself, Swapna Sai, pursuing second year mechanical engineering in Chennai Institute of Technology. Today is our chief guest, Dr. N. Shiva Shanmugam, sir. Dr. N. Shiva Shanmugam is an associate professor at NIT Trichy, did his BE in mechanical engineering from JJ College of Engineering, Bharat Dasan University, Trichy during 2002. He did his ME CAD CAM at Mepco Link Engineering College, Anna University, Chennai in the year 2004. In the year 2012, he received his PhD in mechanical engineering in the field of finite element, elements simu simulation of laser beam building at NIT Trichy. His areas of research interest includes mechanical vibration, product design and developmental strategies, finite element analysis, failure and stress analysis, strength of materials, computer integrated design. He is a member of Society of Automotive Engineers India, Indian Welding Society, Indian Society of Technical Education. He has also published 31 journal papers and eight national and international conference papers. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Uh, thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction. But however, I want to update one thing. Uh, SAR has published more than 120 international journals. You have not uh, updated that. Okay, sir. So, welcome you, sir. Please, uh, you can go for a session, sir. Very good morning, friends. Uh, first of all, I would like to place my sincere gratitude and thankfulness to the doctors, nurses, sanitary workers, policemen, etc., for fighting hard in the coronavirus. And I also thank the chairman of Chennai Institute of Technology, Chennai, and uh, my friend and my student, Dr. V. Dinagaran, for providing me an opportunity to share my little bit of information that I gained at NIT Trichy to the participants who are going to attend this webinar. Before getting into that, uh, I also thank uh, Ms. Swapna for uh, giving an introductory thing about uh, my career at NIT Trichy and uh, my studies. Uh, Thank you, Sapna. Uh, with this thing, I am getting into the uh, fundamentals of strength of materials. So this strength of materials is very, very important subject. That's why our ancestors kept this subject in the third semester. If you could recollect our curriculum, if you rethink our curriculum, it is designed in such a way that especially for mechanical engineering, first year, we have something on engineering mechanics where we are dealing something on statics of rigid body then after understanding the basics of rigid body motion then we'll get into the third semester because previously the semester is designed it is a one year course as far as the first year is concerned now it is split into two and the third semester readily when a person is entered when a when a budding engineer is entered into the 
third semester he is ready to see the subject strength of materials because it is a very very important subject if you are a teacher or if you are a budding engineer or doing your undergraduate studies or post graduation study or you are doing a phd or post doctoral fellowship without this subject without the knowledge of strength of material it is very very difficult to do design a component or analyze a component why what is the speciality of this subject because we are dealing with the geometry characteristics and also the properties of the material in this subject don't worry my dear friends i will get into the definition of strength of material what is the purpose of coining this subject what is the other name for this subject we will discuss all those things in our forthcoming presentation see it is a beautiful slide that you can see a beautiful simple press is represented schematically here what is the purpose of showing a simple press in this presentation i'll get into that so whenever you are designing a structure or a machines like bridges cranes aeroplane ships etc etc if you do some examination on these structures and machine you can see it consists of numerous parts or members connected together in such a way that what is the purpose of this constructions or assembly is to perform a useful function and to withstand the externally applied load it is very very important because these words are highlighted in such a way that if you wrongly put then the entire phrase the entire uh, sentence will go wrong you see the purpose of this if you want to design any component you know that a component is not a single part or something it is a assembly of different members so once these members are connected together the purpose of this connection is to perform or used to do a useful function in such a way that it should withstand the externally applied load for example if we take this simple press it consists of one uh, base and two members are that two vertical members are that we have a lead screw and we have a turn table like arrangement that uh, or we can take it as a turn wheel uh, or it is like a steering wheel and you have a cross head you see cross head is denoted by a letter m and the side members are denoted by a letter n so the base is denoted by a letter e so what is the purpose of this simple press it is it is a testing machine it is used for testing the specimen in such a way that to extract the mechanical properties of the specimen what is the mechanical property the compression strength of the material what are the material you are going to place it may be a steel or concrete etc etc you are going to extract the compression compressive strength of this material by doing the compression in order to get the properties you are going to rotate this turn wheel or you are going to twist it or you are giving a torsion in such a way that this the lead screw will come down and it will lift the object and you are giving the compressive force on the material until fracture you are giving that load after fracture you can find out what is the compression strength of the material by a simple formula load divided by area it is like a axial compression so now so you can see i am i am taking the each and individual members available in this simple press as a separate one you see n denotes the vertical member it is exerted with a tensile load because you are applying a load compressive load on the material because of this compressive load there is a reaction will be acted on in the side members it is in the end so it is acting in a tie it is acting in a pulling direction that is of tensile load the reaction force is something about tensile load in the members and if you could see the job what you are going to test it is exerted with the compressive load that's why it is like a push It is not pull; it is a push, and the turntable that is that uh, uh, the wheel with the lead screw. It is, you are going to rotate it. That you are giving the torque in such a way that it will plunge into the workpiece. Clear? And what is about the cross head? Cross head. It is like a three-point bending test. If you could see each and everything, the member is acted upon with the tensile load, and the 
lock is acted upon with compressive load because of the actuation of this lead screw with respect to the turntable and you can see this is acted upon with the torsion or the twist and the cross head is acted upon with the bending so if you could see each and everything the function of the press is to test the specimen of various materials in compression to accomplish this the specimen is placed on the floor of the base a and the end of the screw is forced down against it by turning the hand wheel at the top so this action subjects the specimen as well as the lower portion of the screw when you are rotating the hand wheel so the lower portion of the screw is acted upon with the axial compression and the side members so it is acted upon with the reaction forces it is then it is of axial tension so due to this happenings the cross at the m is subjected to a bending it is a resemblance of a three point bending test what normally we are doing for composite material testing it is a flexural test it is a three point bending test and the upper part of the screw is acted upon with twist or the torsion that is the load you are giving it manually so if you find if you consolidate all these things uh, then this press uh, is having is acted upon with four different loading system compression tension bending or twist or the torsion so these four basic types of loading of a member are frequently so i am not telling the word that it is always it is frequently encountered in both structures and machine design problem so apart from that we have so many loads are there we have a shear load etc etc but if you take a one example if you want to get involved get into the root you can see a four different types of loading system which is normally which are frequently encountered in a structural mechanics and the machine design problem are compression tension bending twist or the torsion so they may be said to constitute essentially the principal subject matter of strength of material so we are going to deal something about these loads on the body so you are in need of a subject that subject is called strength of material okay now whenever you are designing a component the purpose of designing the component is to withstand to perform the useful function and to withstand the externally applied load that i discussed in my first slide and once you are designing the component you have to analyze this before getting into the manufacturing see otherwise you are unnecessarily wasting your material money men manpower etc etc to avoid that when you are designing a component or a structure or a part of a component or a part of a machine tool once you design it you have to cross check you have to verify whether my design is fulfill the needs or not so for that you have to analyze the component like uh, nowadays old days we are not having any finite element packages or finite element finite difference packages but nowadays with the advent of science and technology we have so many packages whatever may be the design you are doing you can do the analysis and you can find out what will be the output with my design whether my desired output is fulfilled or not by doing the analysis but in olden days we have only empirical relationship or analytical equations to analyze the design the component in such a case what is the main thing once you design a component you have to ask very two different questions to the designed component what about the two questions sir it is very very important my dear friends please look into it so the preamble will give an insight about the strength of materials why do you feel the subject strength of material is an important one especially for mechanical engineer but uh, strength of material is not only the property of the mechanical engineer as i discussed in the second slide it is also the property of a civil engineer but whenever you are designing a component or a machine tool this subject plays a predominant role okay so when you design a component you have to ask the design what is the two question you have to raise in such a way that to fulfill the need is the structure is the design structure strong enough to withstand the loads applied to it so in the preamble 
and are discussed to perform the useful function and to withstand the externally applied load. So you have to ask the first question you have to rise towards your design. Is the structure strong enough to withstand the loads applied to it? First question. Second question, whether it is stiff. If it is stiff enough to avoid excessive deformation and deflection. If you are talking something about the stiffness, you are talking about the rigidity of the material. Then the rigidity means you are talking about that E and I. What is that E? E is something about the inch smallness of the material. That is a mechanical property of the material. And I is the moment of inertia. So you may you may rethink in the olden days, or you can come across this one. Hollow shaft is stronger than the solid shaft. Why? Because the stiffness of the hollow shaft is higher compared to that of the solid shaft. Because the material you are not putting at the centroid or the center of gravity. You are not allowing the put more material towards the center centroid or the center of gravity of the job or the object. So in the hollow shaft, the stiffness is very high. That's why the rigidity of the material is very high. So it is stronger than that of the solid shaft. So you have to think that the geometric characteristics. So once you understand the geometric characteristics, you can easily design the component. First one, the geometric characteristics. Then what is the material you are going to adapt for designing the component, whether it is strong enough whether it will withstand the externally applied load. That is another very, very important thing, my dear friends. So when you design a component, you have to ask two questions. First, to withstand the externally applied load or whether it is stiff enough to avoid the excessive deformation. So once you raise these questions based on the answer, you can analyze it. If it is going wrong, if the design is not proper, then rethink it and redesign the component. That is the main idea behind this subject. Okay. In statics, what is it when you are doing something about on engineering mechanics in statics, the members of structure were treated as rigid body. So if you are in the first year, you can see only the engineering mechanics problem. You are doing only the rigid body. But you, my dear friends, not even a single body in this world considered as a rigid body. All the bodies that we are considering in this real world application is a deformable body. But actually, all materials are deformable. And this property will henceforth be taken into account. That's why you are migrating from engineering mechanics to the strength of material. Thus, so this is the right time I can define. Thus, strength of materials may be regarded as the statics of deformable or elastic bodies. So these are all the things will define about the subject of strength of material. So what we are going to deal, we are dealing only with statics of deformable body it is not a rigid body if it is a rigid body we are talking only with respect to the star engineering mechanics but we are talking about that we are going to work something on the deformable body that is why it is called statics of deformable or elastic bodies okay my dear friends then when you ask the two different questions you have to get the answer for that question what about the answer a beautiful word i have mentioned here both the strength and the stiffness of a structure or function of its size and shape. So I repeat both the strength and stiffness of a structural member or function of its size and shape. If it is size and shape, then it is relevant, then it is related to the geometrical shape of the thing, geometrical characteristics of the body, size and shape and also of certain physical properties of the material not only the physical property it is generally property of the material from which it is made sir if you want to develop a strengthy component then instead of solid shaft go with the hollow shaft for for all the cases you are going for a hollow shaft no if the shaft is uh, up is exerted with the bending then you have to go only on solid shaft then uh, hollow shaft is not supposed to work in that case so Based on the situations, based on the scenario, based on the conditions, you have to design the component. So the strength and the stiffness are the two important things plays a predominant role in designing the component. What is the strength and what is the stiffness? Strength and stiffness are related with the geometrical characteristics and the physical properties of the material or the mechanical properties of the material. Stiffness means you know something about load divided by the deflection. So for the given load, what is the deformation of that? 
so it depends upon the stiffness for example if you take a utm if it is not properly stiffened members are are available on the vertical the are, are not available if, if the stiffness is not properly maintained in the utm with the help of reaction force the failure will not happen to the specimen failure will happen to the vertical rods that we discussed in the first slide that the n n is the member which is hanging vertically it will it, it should be very stiff otherwise the failure will happen the failure will happen not on the specimen the failure will happen on the side vertical bars so whenever you are designing the component you have to ask two things whether it is strength and stiffness strength and stiffness are related to the geometrical characteristics and the physical properties of the material so these physical properties of material are largely determined from the experimental studies of their behavior in a testing mission you can see my dear friends every day you are developing your newer materials you see it may be a functionally graded materials or a composite materials sir i have developed a new composite materials i am going for a pattern sir why sir sir it, it, it is having a very high stiffness strength is also on par with the metals so then you can use the testing machines for finding out the basic mechanical or the physical properties of the material physical properties is oriented with different things it is respect to the density specific weight the thermal conductivity electrical conductivity etc but whereas we are going for the toughness of the material fitting strength of the material creep strength of the material and the tensile strength of the material and compressive strength of the material these are related to the mechanical properties of the material my dear friends now i want to ask two different question my dear friends what is the first question so please rethink is there is any difference between strength and stress of a material because you are well known about that stress you know stress is nothing but the load divided by the area and for both these things we are using the same units for example if you are using a si it is of newton per mm square or kilonewton per mm square or in some books they refer to kilogram per centimeter square or kg of per centimeter square and if you take the ultimate tensile strength is something about in terms of mega pascal or in terms of giga pascal my dear friends please rethink these two words are giving the same meaning or different meaning my second question sir we are discussing about the experimental studies what is the experimental studies you want to find out the physical properties and also the mechanical properties of the newer material that you are developed in the laboratory that you are developed in your mission design lab or you developed in your mechanical testing laboratory what is the purpose sir is there is any difference between experimentation and testing these two different things are very very important to understand the basics because what is the subject we are dealing is that strength of materials fundamentals and this entire webinar is uh, uh, working towards that uh, enriching the ideas on fundamentals of mechanical engineering see my dear friends i repeat my question first question difference between strength and stress of a material second one experimentation and testing first i'll reveal the answer for my first question what is a strength so strength is the property of the material even though you are using the same notation sir same units mega pascal newton per mm square or kilonewton per mm square or kilogram per centimeter square whatever may be the thing but strength is the property of the material so normally you will not ask what is the ultimate tensile stress of a mild steel no we use only that word what is the ultimate tensile strength of the material sir what is this? sir i have developed one composite material i have developed i have developed one functionally graded material then surely the person will ask you what is the strength of the material they will not they will never ever will ask you about that what is the stress of a material so strength is the property of the material where stress is the measurable quantity i repeat strength is the property of the material where stress is the measurable quantity you are measuring the stress you are measuring the tensile stress or you are measuring the shear stress or you are measuring the compressive stress for the given load on the area on which the load is happened where load is acted on so the very very important thing is the property the stress is the measurable quantity and my second question whenever you are developing the newer material you, you know you don't know anything about the outcome of that material see experimentation means 
the outcome is uncertain the outcome is uncertain that new insights are to be gained that is why it is called experimentation i repeat experimentation means the outcome is uncertain that new insights you are giving more you are you are getting you are extracting more information by doing the experimentation that new insights are to be gained that is called experimentation what is that testing so testing is a detailed procedure where limit and test and limit and results are clear you know if you have a mind steel rod you know the strength of the rod you know how to do the uh, testing we, we have to load the thing between the grips you have to apply the inaxial load after after the fracture you have to stop the thing and you have to calculate the smallness of the material or you want to find out the ultimate tensile strength of the material because this procedure is well developed uh, procedure is well clearly developed and you have to follow the procedure and you know the limit so what is the limit you know the capability of the machine this machine will uh, will will apply load up to 100 kN or 10 tens or 5 tens that is the limit and you know the end smallness of the material is equal to 2 into 10 power 5 meter per mm square. So, what is the testing? Testing is that you are going with the uh, defined procedure, you are following the defined procedure where your limits and the results are clear. But in experimentation, this is not possible. The outcome is uncertain. First experiment, it may go wrong. But second experiment, it, it will give a fruitful results to you. That is the main thing. Strength is the property, stress is the measurable quantity. Second question, experimentation is that new insights you are going to develop, you are going to gain when you are doing the experimentation. But testing, bad, your limits and results are clear, you are following the defined procedure. Clear? Next one. So this is the right time I can give what is the aim of coining this subject strength of material. With these all the uh, base information, base fundamentals, uh, I can readily to give what is the aim of coining this subject. The study of strength of material is aimed at predicting just how these geometric and physical properties of a structure will influence its behavior under service conditions. If you put, if you mismatch, if you use the different words, then the entire meaning will go wrong. Sir, I repeat. Why the subject? What is the purpose of this subject? What is the aim of this subject? What is the objective of this subject? The study of strength of material is aimed at predicting just how these geometry characteristics mean size and shape of the object and physical come mechanical properties of a structure will influence. If you put a high strength material, it will not work for some purpose. If you put a hollow shot for a bending area, then it will not withstand. That bending, uh, that bending load. So then you have to replace with the solid shaft. Will influence its behavior under service condition. You have to underline that word under service condition because if you put it stationary, there is no use at all. It should perform useful function. It should be ready in use. That is why we are using that word. Will influence its behavior under service condition, my dear friends. Okay. See, so I have used that word statics. So uh, there must be some continuity uh, in my presentation. So now it's the right time for me to define what do you mean by statically indeterminate or statically determinate. It is very, very important because when you are going for shear force and bending moment diagram, you are talking about the beam theory and we are going for a torsion, torsion of the shaft. Then uh, this uh, it is very, very important to understand the physics of this subject. Uh, what do you mean by statically indeterminate? So I want to thank the Wikipedia. From the Wikipedia, I extract this information. I want to acknowledge here from Wikipedia the information what I want to convey to you in statics and structural mechanics problem. A structure is said to be statically indeterminate means it is also called hyperstatic. When the static equilibrium equations, what do you mean by the static equilibrium equations? We have a translational equilibrium and rotational equilibrium. Force and moment equilibrium. So force equation is a force equilibrium is also called translational equilibrium. Moment equilibrium is also called rotational equilibrium are insufficient for determining the internal forces and reaction on that structure. Sir, what is the purpose of this subject, sir? Whenever you are applying the load on the body, you want to find out what about the reaction forces. 
what is the purpose of finding out the reaction process whether the body is withstand to the externally applied load if the reaction force is very high then the failure will happen to the entire structure to avoid that you have to find out what is that the internal forces and reaction forces exerted in the body when the load is applied externally for that what is the use you are using the static equilibrium equations that is a force equilibrium equations as well as the uh, force equations that is of uh, uh, summation of f is equal to zero vector sum uh, uh, the vectorial sum of the forces acting on the body is equal to zero and uh, if, we, if we consider the force is equal to zero then horizontal summation of horizontal forces is equal to zero summation of vector sum of uh, vertical forces is equal to zero the sum of the horizontal for horizontal components of the forces equals zero and v vector is equal to zero the sum of vertical component of forces equals zero see if we take this simple uh, free body diagram of a statically indeterminate beam why it is called statically indeterminate beam you see the one end is hinged it is represented by a notation a it is represented by a notation a and uh, b is that uh, acted upon with uh, a, we have the roller at position b and we have another roller at the position c so okay when you are drawing the free uh, free body diagram for this statically indeterminate why it is called statically indeterminate so if you take the reaction forces we have va va uh, v a that is a vertical at the junction a v b at the vertical junction b and c at the junction b c and uh, because it is a hinge support if you put a roller then ha will not come because it is a hinge support horizontal reactions at that point a ha and the vertical force f is acting on the statically indeterminate beam why it is statically indeterminate beam see if you take f is the known because you are applying the load on the material a load on the beam so f is known to you and you know the length of the beam you know the position of the supports clear up so a is hinge to support and b are b and c are the rollers see and when you are drawing the free, uh, free body diagram the reactions at the point a b c as well as the horizontal reaction at a is also given in the picture see and uh, what happened to the translation equilibrium the summation vector sum of the forces acting on the body equals zero both in the horizontal as well as in the vertical directions are zero and the moment the sum of moments about an arbitrary point of all forces equals zero this is pertaining to the rotational equilibrium so in the beam construction on the right the four unknown reactions are that you see if we could take the uh, this free body diagram totally four unknown uh, reactions what are they ha ba bb bc okay sir ba bb bc ha the equilibrium equations what is that if you resolve it summation of vertical is equal to zero ba so if you could say it is uh, acting upward direction ba downward should be positive should sorry downward should be negative minus fe plus bb plus bc is equal to zero according to that vertical forces according to the point of summation of uh, vertical sum of the forces vector, vectorial sum of forces ba minus fe plus bb plus bc is equal to zero summation of h is equal to zero that is that sum of the horizontal components is equal to zero so automatically h is equal to zero and the summation of uh, moments about an arbitrary point of all forces equal zero if you take ma is equal to zero then if you take with respect to the a so fe the force which is acting in the downward direction is of clockwise fe into a minus it is of anti clock uh, this is of uh, clockwise and uh, this left hand side is of uh, uh, anti clockwise direction if you take the anti clockwise bb minus bb into a plus b minus bc because we are we are resolving with respect to the point a if we take the with respect to the point a fe into a minus of anti clockwise direction minus bb into a plus b minus bc into a plus b plus c see we have four unknown coefficient but we have only three base equations we have four unknown but the base equations we have only three so how is it possible with the three base equations to find out the four unknown coefficient that is why this structure this beam is called statically indeterminate beam since there are four unknown forces vb va vb vc and ha but only three equilibrium equations the system should be in equilibrium condition we have only three equilibrium equation 
this system of simultaneous equations does not have a unique solution because we have three we have four unknowns and we have only three uh, equilibrium equation it is very difficult to find out the solution for the four unknown so then the structure is called is therefore is said to be in statically indeterminate sir then how i want to find out the fourth unknown or the four unknown uh, reaction forces consideration the material properties that is why strength of materials plays a predominant role we are taking the material property as well as the geometrical characteristics consideration in the material properties and compatibility in deformations are taken to solve statically indeterminate systems or a structure i repeat my dear friends we have only three equilibrium equations we have three equilibrium equations and we have four unknown coefficient so it is very difficult to solve this problem because with three simultaneous equations we can achieve only three unknown coefficients but we have four so you are in need of some other thing where you are extracting the information from the material properties and also the deformation pattern so the delta is equal to strain is equal to sigma by b what is the sigma strain c epsilon is equal to sigma by b sigma is equal to p by a so p by a e is equal to epsilon epsilon is equal to change in length divided by the original length delta divided by l so if we take only the deformation delta delta is equal to p l divided by a e so what is that if we take a a uh, circular rod of length l of cross section a of a material e then if you apply a tensile load what about the deflection deflection is equal to p l divided by a e so with this deformation pattern we are solving the unknown coefficients we are we are finding the unknown coefficient here that is why this beam is said to be statically indeterminate how you are converting this statically indeterminate beam to a statically determined beam sir if you replace a roller if the support at b is removed for example you see if the support b there is no need of putting a roller at this junction so you can remove the roller b we have only the hinge support a and we have a roller at the uh, end c then you are converting the statically indeterminate beam to a statically determined by suppressing the vb if the support at b is removed the reaction vb cannot occur and the system becomes statically determined that is called hyperstatic this is called isostatic note that the system is completely constrained here the system becomes an exact constrained kinematic coupling instead of mechanism it is still act as a structure the solution to this problem is HA is equal to FH because the horizontal component FH because we have a vertical load this is resolved into vertical as well as the horizontal HA is equal to the reaction uh, to that uh, HA yeah, HA is equal to FH BC is equal to the same thing FA into A divided by A plus B plus C and VA is equal to FV minus FVC FV minus VC so with this you can easily find out the unknown coefficient of HA vc and va because we have three equations we have three unknown we can easily solve this problem if in addition the support a the support at a is changed to a roller so previously it is of hinge support so instead of that if you put another roller here so we have only two rollers so roller number 1 and roller number 2 already we suppress the roller number uh, roller number 2 uh, because we suppress the support at b okay so in that case the support at a is changed to a roller support the number of reactions are reduced to 3 without ha because if it is of uh, sliding there is no reaction forces it is of free sliding there is no slide there is no ha but the beam can now be moved horizontally because if you put a roller at the position a and b the beam will be moved freely in the horizontal direction uh, the system becomes unstable or partly constrained a yeah, mechanism it is called a mechanism rather than a structure because it is freely moving if it is freely moving it is not uh, constrained it is a partly constrained it is called a mechanism instead of calling as a structure in order to distinguish between this and the situation when a system under equilibrium is disturbed 
is perturbed and becomes unstable it is preferable to use the phrase partly constrained here in this case the two unknown coefficient ba and bc can be determined by resolving the vertical force equation and the moment equation simultaneously you know the vertical force that is a vectorial sum of the vectorial sum is equal to that is a summation of f vector is equal to zero you take and take the horizontal component or vertical component here you can only have a vertical component and resolve the vertical component and find out the unknown coefficient va and vc because hinge is replaced with the roller there is no ha we have only two unknown coefficient here we have two equations so you can easily solve the problem and find out the unknown coefficient here the solution yields the same results as previously obtained however it is not possible to satisfy the horizontal force equation unless if you could consider fh is equal to zero okay well. so what is that it is a simple thing we have a vertical load we have a two rollers at the end that is a normal uh, simply supported beam we have a reaction at a at reaction at the b and from that r1 plus r2 is equal to w r2 if you take a moment with respect to that point r1 so r2 is equal to wx into l so total number of unknown coefficient is equal to number of static equation is equal to 2 and you can easily solve these equations and find out the unknown coefficient now i can easily uh, i think you can easily understand the meaning of uh, uh, the difference between the statically indeterminate and statically determined in strength of materials we are dealing only with the statically indetermined beams in strength of materials or uh, sorry in engineering mechanics or in later problems with respect to the shear force and bending moment diagram we are using with the statically determined beams but in most of the problem what we are dealing only with the statically indetermined beams what is the statically indetermined beams as far as the equilibrium equations are concerned we have only three if the unknown coefficients are more than three we have to consider we have to consider the mechanical properties as well as the deformation to solve or to predict the unknown coefficient okay now so the so far what we discussed is the strength and stiffness strength is related to the size and uh, shape of the body as well as the physical and mechanical properties stiffness also related to the size and shape and with respect to the physical properties and the mechanical property so it is my intention is to give what do you mean by the properties of the material it may vary with respect to the structure with respect to the grain structure if it is oriented if the grains are very small the strength is very high if you are having a coarser grain then we have a, we, are, we are not getting the adequate strength that's why the forged component the rolled component or grains are oriented in one direction the strength is very very high compared to the cast product okay so the structure the properties of material depends upon structure performance is purely depends upon the structure processing whether it is a forged cast or it is a welded component or it is a rolled component and with respect to the properties so performance of any structure or system is related to the structure of the thing as well as the processing and also the properties of the material so we are standing in these locations and we are finding out the basic properties of the material okay so these are all interrelated to each other okay so when you go for the properties of the material especially the mechanical properties and it is broadly divided into two category mechanical as well as the physical property so the mechanical properties are useful to estimate how parts will behave when they are subjected to a mechanical loads we are using a different testing machines we are using a utm we are using an impact testing machine we are using a torsion we are using a fatigue testing machine we are using a creep testing machine to find out the creep strength of the material fatigue strength of the material ultimate insert strength of the material toughness of the material torsional rigidity or the torsional strength of the material so these are all the machines we are applying the mechanical load and you are extracting the basic mechanical property of the material this property includes strength, ductility of the material, what is the elongation, percentage of elongation. See, if we take a gold, the ductility is very, very high. You can draw into a thin wires that is called ductility. The ability of the material to draw into your wires, harness of the, it is a, a resistance to the indentation, elasticity of the material. Whether it is elasticity, it will not show the permanent deformation, toughness of the material, the impact strength of the material. Creep strength, the progressive deformation, 
fatigue it will withstand the repetitive loads reversing loads as well as the repetitive loads when you go for the physical properties of the material physical properties define the behavior of material in response to the physical forces other than the mechanical loads what are they so i think i have discussed previously it is related to the density of the material sir i am going for titanium instead of steel why sir because it is of less dense and we have achieved more strength sir comparatively to the steel this titanium is something around 4800 kg per meter cube but steel is something around 7800 kg per meter cube but when you go for the strength aspect it's very very high so with the less density material i am achieving a very high strength then you can go for a, a titanium material only thing is it is of expensive but when you put more amount of money into the product development then you can achieve a better strength as well as the uh, very light weight we can achieve a light weight and adequate strength okay so density specific heat melting point thermal expansion conductivity mechanical property sir why we are dealing all those things sir sir these two things you can teach the design engineer and also the mechanical manufacturing engineer because whenever a design engineer is doing something it should be understandable it should be understandable by a manufacturing engineer then only he can produce the product in the shop floor that is why i have given a beautiful sentence at the end of the thing the manufacturing engineer should appreciate the design viewpoint and the designer should be aware of the manufacturing viewpoint so then they should have a concurrent engineering between the design engineer and the manufacturing engineer so he could appreciate the manufacturing engineer manufacturing engineer can appreciate the design engineer to develop a product by understanding the physics of the problem once you understand the physics of the problem related to the strength of material he can develop the product in a more beneficial and more efficient way okay so when you go for this mechanical properties this will give a this gif file will give an idea about what do you mean by the strength what do you mean by the ductility the percentage of elongation the elasticity so that is that deformations without permanently distorted okay elasticity and the fitting creep toughness of the material what do you mean by different the impact strength of the material the resistance to scratch okay wow. that is called the harness these mechanical properties are usually determined by subjecting prepared specimens to standard laboratory tests so for each test there is a different standards ASTM E8 for your tensile subsection so many sections are there bending strength they have so many uh, uh, ASTM E standards you have to prepare a coupons according to the standard and you want to extract the mechanical property by uh, giving the mechanical load with the proper testing machines so when you go with the stress strain relationship my dear friends so this is the right moment i can ask another question to you whatever may be the books whoever wrote that book uh, all the books are given an information about uh, stress is directly proportional to strain uh, within an elastic limit of the material what is the cook's law stress is directly proportional to strain within an elastic limit of the material so not even a single book uh, is giving an information about why not strain is directly proportional to stress all the books are insisted are given an information about stress is directly proportional to so strain why not strain is directly proportional to stress you please think my dear friends i'll come back to you so my question is clear so whatever may be the book or the open sources if you could take if you read the informations or the open sources or videos youtube videos or mo kpdl whatever may be the videos if you could say if you put the hooks law stress is directly proportional to strain e is equal to stress by strain uh, within the elastic limit of the material or some book it may be the proportionality limit not it will be below the yield point of the material so not even a single book are given an idea about why strain is why is directly proportional to stress? why why not strain is directly proportional to stress okay i'll come back to the answer for the question in the next time the fourth coming slides sir. sir when you go with the stress strain relationship with respect to the utm we are going to apply a inaxial load 1d that is i am talking about the one dimensional when you take the one dimensional stress is directly proportional to strain e is equal to stress by strain and uh, 
as per the Hooke's law within the elastic limit when the space when the space when the material is stressed within the elastic limit as for the potential information when the material is just, uh, when the material is stressed within the elastic limit of the material the stress is directly proportional to strain okay now when you are going for this uh, basic type of stresses available in the materials are when you are applying a tensile when you are applying a tensile load the resulting stress is of tensile stress when you are using the compressive load the resulting stress is of the compressive stress and the shear load you are getting out the shear stress what about the tensile stress tend to stretch the material i think i have showcased one uh, uh, one some gif file but you are stretching the material you are stretching the material and there is an elongation of the material correct as that so as for the bookish information if i want to define the stress induced in a body when a body is subjected to two equal and opposite pulls if you are pulling the material then the stress induced is called tensile stress okay because of this action what will happen there is an elongation of the material so the change in length divided by the original length is called tensile strain change in length means there is an extension that is it is the material uh, the material is elongated so if we take the change in length divided by the original length is equal to the tensile strain i repeat the stress induced in a body when the body is subjected to two equal and opposite pulls so because of this action there is an increase in the length of the rod the change in length divided by the original length is called tensile strain please listen my dear friends my words stress induced in the body and strain produced by the body so don't use the different words stress means it is in, induced in the body that is called the induced stresses or the tensile stresses and the because of this stress strain is produced by the body that is called the strain that is a tensile strain because of that elongation tensile strain is happened in the body okay va well, stress induced and strain produced see when you go for the compressive stress strain definition the, the stress induced in the body when the body is subjected to equal and opposite push if we push the body like what you have given in this schematic representation compressional stress because of that there is a contraction in the length of the body there is a decrease in length of the body the change in length divided by the original length is equal to the then compressive strain so only the thing is it is of pull and the compression strength is of the push pull and the push so if you put p push divided by a area of the cross section so stress is equal to p by a it is of pull when you go for the compressive stress it is something about p another p it is for the push divided by a so if you consider p is equal to load in terms of newton or you can term give in terms of w in terms of kg because industry versions because academicians we are using only the notations p divided by a but industry versions they are using the notations w or the foreigners the uk the britishers are using w divided by a bar w is equal to in terms of kg not in terms of newton if you take p we are we are giving in terms of newton but the foreigners in britishers are that uh, Foreign countries and foreign author books they are utilizing the notations W divided by E. What happened to the shear stress? So as far as this bookish information is concerned, same thing. The stress induced in the body when the body is subjected to equal and opposite opposite forces are uh, in such a way that the the forces are acting tangentially. The forces are acting tangentially across in the river across the resisting sections. I repeat. the stress induced in the body when the body is subjected to two equal and opposite forces the forces are acting tangentially it is acting tangentially across the resisting section due to this action the body tends to shear off across the resisting section the stress induced in the body is called the shear stress the corresponding strain is called shear strain i repeat So the stress induced in the body, when the body is subjected to equal and opposite forces, due to this action, uh, uh, these forces are acting tangentially across the resisting section. Due to this action, the body tends to shear off across the section. The stress induced in the body is called shear stress, and the corresponding strain is called 
sheer strain. See, it's a very, very beautiful example. If you take any book, it use something on two sheet metals are jointed with the help of rivets. Okay, well, so when you are pulling these two sheet metal, what happened? The tangential forces are acting between the junction, the, the junction between the sheet metal. So automatically the rivets will tends to shear off across the junction. Okay, that stress is called the stress induced on the rivet is called shear stress. The due to this, there is a change in if there is a change in uh, dimension, that change in dimension is called the change in dimension divided by the original dimension or the change in length or the change in body dimensions divided by the original dimension is called the shear strain. Clear us up. These are something about the stress strain relationship with respect to that only. So this picture will give an idea about uh, when you are loading the specimen in the UTM, in your universal testing machine and you are applying the tensile load, what about the deformation, progressive deformation happening in the system is clearly mentioned in this picture. Okay, so what is that? First it is of L0, it is of uh, uh, original length of the rod, then you are applying the load and it crosses the elastic limit, then yield point, automatically it reaches the ultimate tensile load. After it reaches the ultimate load, the localized neck formation, there is a formation of uh, neck, there is a formation of neck in the specimen and still if you are applying the load, the fraction will happen with respect to the specimen in the necking region. Clear up. The final thing, so this is the final specimen LF. So what about the steps? Beginning of test, no load, uniform elongation and reduction of cross-sectional area, continued elongations, maximum load reach, that is at the back. Uh, ultimate uh, tensile load or the ultimate compressive load. If you are compressing the material, it is called the uh, uh, maximum uh, compressive load. If you are applying tensile, then it is a maximum tensile load reached. Necking begins, neck load begins to decrease and finally the fracture. If pieces are put back together as in six, final length can be measured. See, this is a typical picture. So, my dear friends, I am not getting more in-depth to the tensile stress graph, that is of a stress strain graph, because you can speak for one day about the information pertaining to stress strain graph. So, I am giving some small, small, small information to this uh, stress strain graph alone. Uh, so, it is of that uh, yield strength, below that we have the elastic limit. Within that, if you take the slope, a small less is constant. So, as for the Cook's law, E is equal to stress by strain within the elastic limit is constant. Above that, so normally if you take a mild steel rod, for example, I can draw. One second. Ah, so this is a this is not the mild steel, this is take a stainless steel. If you take a stainless steel, you'll you'll not get the distinct, but somehow this is the point where you can achieve the yield strength. There is no distinct yield point. I, 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 I give more information about the yield point in the forthcoming uh, slides. Uh. See, this is the yield strength. Below that, we have the uh, elastic limit where the, where the, insert, where the stress, strain, uh, stress by strain is equal to constant, slope stress strain graph, and then you have the ultimate tensile strength. Then you are getting the fracture. Okay, so the area under this curve, the area under this curve is called modulus of resilience. I repeat the area under this curve. So this portion alone, uh, this portion alone, I'll take uh, the pointer, I'll take the pen. So this portion is that, this portion is alone, is known as modulus of resilience. So what is the model of resilience? I'll, I, I'll give more information about the modulus of resilience. This portion, this area under the curve, entire curve is called modulus of toughness. These two things are related to the strain energy principle. Strain energy means it is equal to the work done. That is the second chapter in the strength of materials as far as the curriculum is concerned. The area under the curve is called modulus of toughness. The area under the only with respect to the elastic limit, not with respect to the yield point, only with respect to the elastic limit. The area under the curve is called modulus of resilience. The entire thing is called the modulus of toughness. This portion, this portion alone, I am, I am talking about this portion. This portion is called the strain hardening. Why it is strain hardening? You are plastically deforming the material. You are not allowing the material to, uh, 
uh, to elongate the, to you are not allowing the material to load beyond the ultimate load but you are loading up to the ultimate load of the material so you are deforming the material plastically the effect that you are achieving because of plastically deforming the material is called stain hardening okay va after that after that when you are further increasing the load it leads to the fracture this is called fracture stress this portion is called the ultimate tensile stress of the material and this is that yield stress of the material this yield stress is also called yield strength ultimate tensile stress is also called the ultimate tensile strength of the material and fracture stress is also called the fracture strength fracture stress you are measuring that is called a measurable quantity from that you are finding out the strength of the material that is a property of the material clear as sir sir during when i discussed this thing in my class a uh, person here do uh, yeah, i i forgot the name of the student he raised and he asked me about the one question that question made me at that moment it is very difficult to answer his question i realized myself i think uh, and i refreshed my uh, fundamentals and i answered that question i am sharing the information to you sir why if you draw a line here for example if i am if i am drawing a line here if i am drawing a line sir for a single stress value how we are getting a two strain clear up so i repeat the question my dear friends i am not discussing the answer for the question what i raised previously if i ask this question I, I, my second question is sir if i am drawing a horizontal line with respect to the stress for a single stress value for example if you take this is of 1200 megapascal if you take a 1200 megapascal line uh, if you intersect with the stress strain curve of a mild steel rod i am getting a two different strain how is it possible see my dear friends we are talking only with the engineering stress and strain what is the difference between engineering stress and engineering strain uh, what is the difference between engineering stress and strain as well as the true stress and strain so engineering stress and strain where we are taking the area of the cross section is uniform throughout the test throughout the test see i repeat the answer sir if we take the engineering stress strain curve i am taking i am considering the area of the cross area of the cross section is constant for example if you recollect the olden days of silicon materials laboratory the technical assistant will give i gave a uh, technical assistant gave one rod of diameter 10 mm so what is the cross section pi by 4 d square pi by 4 10 square is the cross section area you are considered for throughout your calculations you are not changing anything in such a cases if you could see the cross section area is constant but uh, what happens when you are loading the burn when you are loading the structure or when you are loading the load once it reaches the ultimate load it crossed for example the load pertaining to this stress value is around a uh, 100 kilo newton uh, sir 100 1000 newton all it is of 1 km so it crosses the 1000 and reaches a maximum load of around 1500 for example if we consider it is of 1500 or uh, 1.5 km that is a maximal tensile load the material will withstand after it reaches the 1500 it is once again coming down because the material is not having the tendency of absorbing the load so whenever you are giving the load the material will not observe the load clear up so once again it is coming back to the 1000 position and it is crossing the 1000 and reaches to a minimum most value maybe of 800 or 600 depends upon the material depends upon the loading condition clear depends upon the strain rate so the material will undergo will cross this 1000 newton twice clear twice because of we are considering only the uniform cross section area of pi by 4 d square we are crossing the loads twice that's why when you are calculating the stress we have one stress for that you are getting a two deformation because necking starts once the necking starts it leads to a fracture so there is a change in the cross section area but that cross section area we are not considered for the calculation i repeat my dear friends so when you are reaching the ultimate load it crosses 1000 newton but the Uh, even though if you are giving the load but the material is not having the tendency of absorbing the load so it, it is it is declining the load so once it is declining the load it will not absorb the load the load will drop from 1500 to 800 by crossing the 1000 newton so when you are calculating the thrust 
so we have the load load is uh, cross twice up so 1000 divided by the cross section area is also uniform throughout the calculation then for a single stress value you are attaining a two strain clear as that that is the answer for this question if you could refer and you can get more information with respect to this question see these are all the things modulus of resilience modulus of toughness and the strain hardening behavior why i am talking about the strain hardening when you are doing the research without strength of materials if a person is doing on materials he is not he is not person who is who is giving a very good research to the outside world so understand the strength of material subject then go for testing of material sir i am working on strain hardening material sir i am working on strain hardening steel what do you mean by strain hardening i am plastically deforming the material to get the adequate strength of the material clear as sir that is called the strain hardening steel if you google it you can get more exposure in that okay sir so this is the graph this is the typical graph for a mild steel but uh, i uh, i forgot to tell you one thing my dear friends what about the derivations that we are deriving what about the graph that we are deriving what about the graph that we are plotting or representing to the outside world by assuming in such a way that all the material behavior the behavior of the material in this world is of isotropic and homogeneous in nature otherwise not even a single equation in strength of material is valid please understand my dear friends assume in such a way that the material behavior is isotropic and homogeneous in nature but my dear friends when you do a research when you do a tensile strength on a mild steel you will not get this beautiful graph of upper yield point lower yield point and all those things okay so this is only a theoretical graph you can achieve the practical graph very close to the theoretical graph according to the machines that you are using according to the strain that you are adapted for the testing see this is a typical graph for plotted for mild steel rod when you are when you are applying a miaxial tensile load you have a a that is of elastic it is of uh, uh, yield stress this is upper yield point and the lower yield point and what is the difference between this is the curve which indicates which indicates the true stress and strain clear are the dotted graph will give the information pertaining to true stress and strain that the smooth graph when the continuous line indicates the the continuous line indicates the engineering stress and strain what is the difference in engineering stress and strain we are considering the uniform cross section we are considering the cross section of uh, the rod is uniform throughout the test but while in the two stress and strain we are considering the instantaneous area of cross section so when you are crossing that uh, yeah when you are crossing this uh, yield point when you are crossing this uh, uh, when you are crossing the yield point of the material so you all there is a lateral deformations then why we are talking about the poisson ratio there is a lateral deformations that lateral deformation we are considering and that lateral deformation that cross section area you are considering for the calculations that's why when you are plotting the graph between two stress and strain two strain engineering stress and engineering strain there is a lot of deviation above the upper yield point because you are getting the lateral contraction clear as sir don't worry i will discuss the poisson ratio in the forthcoming slide so what is the thing i want to emphasize here sir when you when you are taking when you are raising this question what is the question why you are getting a two strain value for a single stress because you are considering only the uniform cross sectional area throughout the calculation and uh, when you go for the true stress and strain you are considering the instantaneous area above the yield point you are considering the instantaneous area for the calculations that's why you are getting a ultimate tensile stress is greater than the ultimate tensile stress happened in the engineering stress and strain because the cross section area is very minimum compared to the uniform cross section area considered in the engineering stress and strain okay so and another point i want to emphasize here whenever you are developing a new material and you want to find out what is a yield point but you are not supposed to get the distinct yield point in the graph then what is the idea they are doing what is the idea we are following in our laboratory what the scientists what the materials engineers are adapting here take a point to percentage of strain here take a point to percentage of strain here uh, i'll draw take a point to percentage of strain along the x axis point to percentage of the and draw 
a line pair will take a point to percentage of uh, uh, strain from the graph and draw a line parallel to this behavior that is of elastic behavior this will intersect the curve at a point clear up what is that where this of point two percentage point two percentage point two percentage of proof stress if it is so why this point two percentage we are taking a point two percentage of strain if we take a point two percentage of strain if you take a point to percentage of strain and draw a line parallel to this elastic line elastic line so that will intersect the curve if the yield point is not distinctly given in the graph if you take the output from the graph if it is not readily pointed out then the intersection point will give an idea about the yield point this is called point 2 point 2 percentage proof stress clear up p yes it is called point to percentage why we are talking about if you take any materials data book uh, every time they will not give the yield point they will mention something about yts in the bracket they will mention point to percentage proof stress what it indicates means this is the idea behind that if the yield point is not distinctly given in the graph then take point to percentage and draw a graph draw a line parallel to the elastic behavior that will intersect the curve that point is called point to percentage proof stress okay what so this is the thing ah now i will disclose the answer for the question what i raised previously why is strain is not directly proportional to stress i want to give one small example for example if you consider if a, if you ask your student to come uh, to to come and stand on with you and you can give a big slap to his cheek if you give a big slap to cheek to his cheek what will happen his cheek will bulge correct if you give a big slap to his cheek his cheek will bulge how what happen because suddenly he got a hit from your uh, from from the teacher what happened the stress induced in the body the stress induced in the body allow him to give a another slap to give a, a, the internal stress induced in the body allow him uh, react him in such a way that he will come and hit you correct uh, because of this internal stress internal stress of the stress induced in the body what is that strain produced by the body because of the bulge in the stick that is a strain that stress sir uh, that stress is proportional to the strain correct uh, sir i repeat uh, you are giving a big slap to your cheek uh, your, your student's cheek uh, his cheek will bulge the strain produced already the strain is produced because there is a change in uh, there is a bulge there is a change in the cheek shape uh, automatically because of this action if he is a lively person uh, if he is a good man uh, what happened the stress induced inside the body this stress uh, will automatically will react in such a way that he will come and hit you correct uh, unnecessarily if you are unnecessarily hitting him then this induced the stress is directly proportional to the strain for example if a people if a person is in a coma if you know if a coma person if, if you visit a coma person all the blood circulation will go he is unable to speak uh, but all the reaction will happen in his body will be happen in his body correct will happen in his body so blood circulation will be that in such a cases if you give a big slap to his cheek automatically there will be a bulge there will be a bulge but he will never come and hit you because the strain the stress is not induced in the body because he is in the coma i repeat if a person is in the coma if you are hitting him if you are if you are hitting him then his by his uh, cheek will bulge but he is unable to hit you because there is no stress at all strain only strain is that so that's why i raise this question strain will never ever directly proportional to stress but stress is directly proportional to strain you it is not convinced the the answer is not convinced correct it is not a convincable answer so i will explain in terms of engineering aspects sir i think uh, everyone uh, if you have something uh, uh, if you have a google or you just type the thermal stresses huh? what happened you know alpha what do you mean by alpha alpha is something about the coefficient of thermal expansion so if you are heating the rod uh, because of this alpha it expands along that alpha means coefficient of 
thermal expansion in terms of linear thermal expansion it is it is expanding linearly either in the x axis or y axis or z axis clear up for example it is expanding along the y axis if you are heating the rod it freely expands it is freely expanding along the y direction but uh, what happened free expansion in free expansion there is no stress at all see if there is no stress at all if we have the calculations what is the increase in the length of the rod is e it is equal to alpha tl if you if you could refer the book or if you refer the open sources the expansion the increase in length is equal to alpha tl alpha is the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion t is the day, raise in temperature or fall in temperature l is the length of the rod this will give the increase in length of the rod when you are heating the rod thermally when you are heating the rod clear up sir when you are when you are allowing the rod expand freely uh, there is no stress at all but there is a strain that strain is called compressive strain because uh, sorry uh, that there is a strain uh, it is elongating it is a tensile strain because there is a change in length divided by the original length it is expanding that is a strain but you are, if you are not allowing the rod to expand freely if you are providing some hindrance if you are if you are allowing some hindrance if you are putting some obstacle in such a way that you are not allowing the rod to expand freely you are constraining the material to restrict the motion of the rod then stress is induced in the body that stress is directly proportional to strain strain will never ever directly proportional to stress if you are not allowing the body to freely expand then only stress will induced in the body in that case stress is directly proportional to strain if you are allowing the body to freely expand there is no stress at all it is a free expansion in that case strain will never ever directly proportional to stress the thermal stress is also called compressive stress you are not allowing the body to expand so you are compressing you are restricting the motion the stress induced in the body is called compressive stress the resulting strain is called compressive strain thermal stress is also called compressive stress if we get more into the thermal stress part okay friends uh, uh, during my question i didn't uh, raise anything about uh, compressive stress or tendencies and my question is very clear stress is directly proportional to strain why not strain is directly proportional to stress i gave the answer to this one thank you next step okay so uh, i have discussed the modulus of resilience modulus of toughness and the strain hardening so these and all it's very very important it is of in depth when you are going for mechanics of solids the other name of strength of metals we are having uh, mechanics of solids the uh, solid mechanics etc etc so if you if you refer popo the book popo and all uh, timoshenko so you can get in depth information about the strain hardening of the with respect to the stress strain graph after the material yields see after it crosses the yield point it begins to experience a high rate of plastic deformation that's why I, uh, during my explanation i gave the answer that you are plastically deforming the material once the material yields uh, it begins to strain harden which increases the strength of the material so you are plastically deforming which in turn will enhance the strength of the material in the stress strain graph below the strength of the material can be seen to increase from the yield point y and the ultimate strength at point u this increase in strength is the result of strain hardening you see if we take this position this position is y and this position is u there is an increase in the strength that's why it carries more load it takes care of it it absorbs the load then only there is an enhance in the strength of the material so this is the point they are inform they are referring to so what is it this is y point this is y and this is the u ultimate point okay ma see mod is the modulus of resilience modulus of resistance is the amount of the strain energy per unit volume so what do you mean by the strain energy here u is equal to work done is equal to strain energy how we are calculating the work done uh, friends uh, please take a one paper and if you want you can write something here what is the strain energy the energy stored by the body the strain energy absorbed by the body and stored and stored in the body uh, see u is equal to the work done how we are calculating the work done if you take a, a stress strain graph the 45 degree curve uh, if you take a, it is a straight line it is a 45 degree line 
So uh, along the x-axis we have a strain x, along the y-axis we have p. So the area under the curve is something about, it's like a right angle triangle of p into x. So x is no nothing but a delta where you are where you are putting out the pl, pl divided by ae already we have defined. We have discussed about delta is equal to pl divided by ae. After substitutions, you know p by a is equal to sigma. After rearranging, you are achieving the notation u is equal to sigma square divided by 2e into v. That is the strain energy stored in the body. So within the elastic limits means it is called modulus of resilience. Modulus of resilience is equal to condition states that within the elastic limit sigma square 2e into v divided by v. So the modulus of resilience is the amount of strain energy per unit volume. What is the strain energy? Sigma square divided by 2e into v divided by e divided by v. So sigma square divided by 2e into v divided by whole divided by v. So this v will, will cancel. So modulus of resilience is equal to modulus of resilience is equal to sigma square divided by 2e. So that is also called strain energy density that a material can absorb without permanent deformation. What is the permanent deformation? It is talking only with respect to the elastic limit. The modulus of resilience is calculated as the area under the stress strain go up to the elastic limit. Clear? What happened to the modulus of toughness? So very, very important, my dear friends. Even though if you are not doing the any impact testing, you can take the, you can draw a stress strain graph from that, you can easily extract the toughness value. <coughs> the modulus of toughness is the one second part. The modulus of toughness is the amount of strain energy per unit volume that the material can absorb just before it fracture. Sir, so modulus of resilience means it is within the elastic limit, it is called modulus of resilience. But modulus of toughness is just below, before the fracture. Okay, wow. That is why the area under the curve, the full area under the curve is of modulus of toughness. If you draw a line here, before fracture, it is called modulus of toughness. Before elastic limit, it is called modulus of resilience. Okay, same energy per unit volume that the material can absorb just before it fractures. The modulus of toughness is calculated as the area under the sustained curve up to the fracture point. Okay, so uh, after that, I'm going to discuss a typical problem where you are not uh, uh, able to see in the normal books. So I have referred some open sources. I have referred some uh, video lectures. After that, uh, we have, uh, I have extracted the problems. Before that, because if I am not supposed to miss the continuity. So when I am discussing something about the strain energy, you know something about three loads. We are finding out the strain energy with respect to the three loading conditions according to the curriculum, according to the syllabus of the strength materials. We have a gradually applied load, gradually applied load. From that, we are finding out u is equal to sigma square divided by 2e into v. Clear up. And the second thing that is a suddenly applied load. That is also very easy. You are equating the equations. And the third one, it is a load with an impact. So that is not clearly explained in any books. You can get the derivation, but it is not properly explained, my dear friends. I just give an information about the impact loading that is available in the last slide. I'll go to the last slide and explain. Okay. Uh, okay. Sir, when you go with this impact loading, uh, please, my dear friends, please listen carefully. What do you mean by the impact? You are having a you are having a mass. That mass is going to hit the body. What is the static? It is add if the if the dead mass is added to the body because of the dead mass. There is an elongation means it is called static loading. That is given here. You see a massless rod where you are adding the dead load. The same load what you are giving as an impact. If you are added to the end of the massless rod. Then the deformation because of this dead load is equal to delta st. Correct, sir? Delta st means static deformation. Static deformation is equal to, we already discussed the PL divided by AE. Instead of P, we are using the notation W. Load considered as a mass. Mass here, what is that? W is equal to mass into gravity. 
So if you want to get only the mass, mass is equal to W divided by G. Weight is equal to mass into G because normal Indian authors we are using P, but the foreign authors they are using only with the weight because you are adding a mass to the massless rod at the end. So if this uh, this added weight is giving a deformation that is of delta static, which is equal to W L by A E, where W is equal to mass into gravity, which is equal to W. What we are doing, uh, we are not using this thing for that the third, that is a load with an impact. What we are going to do here, we are adding a collar, so we are adding a collar mass and we are putting a small nut arrangement and we are hinged to this. When you are releasing the nut, this collar mass will come and hit to the stopper which is available at the end of the massless rod. Please my dear friends, with reference to this stop, this collar mass is having the potential energy. Correct? Because you are throwing from one height at a height of H. At a height of H. So it is having its own potential energy. My dear friends, I explain once again. With reference to this stop, this mass, this collar mass is having the potential energy. When you are releasing this nut, if you put a nut, it is connected with the massless string. When you are releasing the nut, this collar will come and hit the stop. Correct? So with reference to this stop, this is having a potential energy. Once it touches the stop, the potential energy is converted into a kinetic energy 100%. See my dear friends, this potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. If you see what is the velocity, because where kinetic energy means you have a half m e square. So what about the velocity at this junction? If you take a velocity at this junction, I will write here, it is Mr. V is equal to, if you take at this point, if you take a V, V is equal to, uh, V is equal to root of 2 G H. Because it is a mass, it is towards, it is, a, uh, it is towards the gravity and H is the height. Uh, if you take the velocity at this junction, like a, a kinetic energy, V is equal to root of 2 G H. This 100% of this potential energy is converted into kinetic energy 100%. After that, this energy will force the stop to deform along the length direction. What happens? This energy, what is occurred here, will move the entire massless rod to a position. That position, so when it reaches to a uh, outermost position, the energy will be loosened in order to move the rod, in order to move the stop to a desired location. So automatically the kinetic energy at this location to at this datum 2 is 0. See, initially the kinetic energy is 0, but once it touches this stopper, it acquires the kinetic energy. That energy is used for moving the stopper to a desired location. Once you move to a desired location, it will loosen it will loosen the it, it, it is loosening the it is loosening the energy to do the work so the energy is neither be created nor be destroyed it is converted from one form of the energy to another form potential energy kinetic energy kinetic energy is released to move the job here so the change in kinetic energy is equal to zero so if we take delta ke is equal to zero but if we take the potential energy initially we have a potential energy Finally, the potential energy is equal to zero. What is the initial potential energy? Mg H plus delta max. So if you take that equation, delta potential energy is equal to load into extension. Load into extension. If you write something, potential energy is equal to delta Pe is equal to, uh, delta Pe is equal to load, which is equal to load into your extension. Extension means what is here? Load is equal to the dead weight. What is the dead weight here? It is something about mg. What is the extension? It, it, it happens. What is the extension? It, it made. What is that? It is of h plus delta x. So when you want to deriving the strain energy using the impact loading system, strain energy due to the impact loading, u is equal to the strain energy stored in the body which is equal to the work done, which is equal to change in kinetic energy plus K, the change in potential energy. But that is according to this method, according to the mechanism, according to the fundamentals of this impact loading is concerned, 
there is no change in potential energy there is, there is no change in kinetic energy so it is crossed to zero we have a delta pe delta pe is something about load into extension what is the load here w w means it is of mg into h plus delta max because the maximum stretch uh, the energy is going to lose to stretch the body to the maximum extent what is the change in potential energy initially we have a mg into h plus delta x finally it achieves zero value by stretching the body and you know something about already i have discussed sigma square divided by 2e into volume sigma square divided by 2e where we have derived this one u is equal to 1 by 2 that is the area of the triangle of bh of into p into x x you are applying that pl divided by a e p by a you know something about sigma so if you put substitute all those things you are getting out the same energy basic equation sigma square into volume divided by 2e okay well, so if you equate these two equations and you are making in terms of the quadratic equations finally you could achieve what is that sigma static is something about sigma static is equal to static stress static stress it is of uh, this is a maximum stress because why it is maximum stress because maximum stretch maximum deflections you can achieve because of the impact loading so w by a is equal to sigma w by a is equal to sigma static so once you put all those things you are getting out the final equations so this is only a uh, small manipulations so you take convert this entire equation into a quadratic form you know the quadratic equation is equal to minus b plus or minus root of b square minus 4 ac divided by 2a you take only the positive remove the negative take only the positive value and find out the equations so once you find out the equations you can substitute and if you if you get the ratios sigma maximum divided by the sigma st which is equal to delta max by delta st okay well, so delta max divided by delta st we are getting out these equations it is clearly explained in all the books only missing is that fundamentals so please prepare your fundamentals when you are facing your students because facing our students is a very very difficult task is a challenging task because they are throwing so many questions to us in order to make us in something make ourselves in a different in a delicate situations okay ma so to avoid that please prepare yourselves what is the fundamental behind that impact loading if you refer any book even a popo or timo shanko or wabira jatsit whatever may be the book you are referring this explanation pertaining to the change in kinetic energy gain in potential energies is missing that's why our purpose our purposely i prepared this presentation to you i am giving enriching your ideas in terms of fundamentals okay well, so this is the equations you are obtained the impact factor is something about greater than 1 so when you take a sigma max it is greater than that of the sigma st okay well, sigma static and sigma maximum okay so uh, and uh, uh, we are so far what we discussed with respect to the one dimensional law so we take a uniaxial uh, 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 tensile load and you are finding out what is the deformation in the body so with this uh, for this i am i am i am preparing some typical problems because when you want to get the uh, when you want to capture your students perceptions when you want to uh, showcase yourself in a different uh, to the students then you have to prepare uh, uh, prepare uh, this one what is that prepare your uh, problems in such a way that it should attack practically because theoretical things it's okay but if you attack practically it will give some more meaningful results and you can impart the knowledge of strength of materials in depth to the students okay so i will just discuss the problem uh dinagaran dinagaran yes sir yes sir uh dinagaran time irka yes sir please you will go sir please sir okay okay how long will go sir uh another 20 minutes i'll uh, refresh and i'll wind up huh? please sir please sir please sir okay I, i'll skip some uh, two or three problems because i'll share the slide to you so sure, you can uh, you can give your slides to the participants okay fine, sir, fine, sir. please sir okay so the the piston of a, a deep a deep well pump because it is like a normal cylinder assembly so i am coining this problem with respect to the axial deformations and also with respect to the application the piston of a deep well pump is operated by a vertical prismatic steel rod this is a, a prismatic steel rod of length l which is equal to 100 meter attached to a crank this is a crank at its upper end as depicted in the figure determine the extreme values of it is only a normal tensile stress prediction and the compressive stress calculations but if you if you what is that if you give this problem with the 
uh, with the flavors if you put some chocolate flavor and if you put a vanilla flavor then they can easily take the problem in a more easy manner clear up so you have to correlate your problem with a practical example values of tension and compressive stresses if the raw in the raw if the strength if, if the resistance on the piston during the downward so during the pushing it is of 100 kg during the upward so during the pulling it is of 1000 kg so the cross sectional area of the rod is of a 2 square centimeter and its density is 8000 kg per centimeter square uh, per cubic meter okay va it is of kilogram per meter cube okay va sir sir in this uh, normal we have in the bansal or in that uh, rajput or something in the ramamrutam etc etc they are purposely giving the code of density when you go with the fun of the book especially i want to th thimoshan ko thank i want to thank thimoshan ko and yenga because i accepted so many problems from thimoshan ko and yenga and biram johnson because that problem is practically oriented see if they are giving something in terms of density so once there is a density in the problem then we have to calculate we have to find out the weight of the rod so it is very very important the purposely they have given out the new specific weight or the density of the rod then from the density you have to find out the what is the weight of the rod you see it is of kilogram per meter cube if you multiply the meter cube if you multiply the volume of the density you can get the weight of the rod then weight of the rod plus resistance will give the load actual load on the rod once you find out the actual load in the rod you can find out the tensile stress and the compressive stress clear as a see what is the weight of the rod according to the solution of this problem within a two steps you can get the solutions but if you miss the weight the entire problem will go wrong w l by a which is equal to 8000 divided by 10 power 6 they are converting everything in terms of meter okay why everything in terms of centimeter sorry everything in terms of centimeter because they are projecting in terms of centimeter square so 10 power 6 it is 8000 uh, uh, kilogram per uh, meter cube by it is converted in terms of kilogram per centimeter cube converted in terms of kilogram per centimeter cube and this length is also converted 100 mm is converted to centimeter 100 meter is converted to 100 into 100 and the area of the cross section is given in terms of uh, uh, centimeter square so the weight of the rod what you are obtaining is something around 160 kg so the load the maximum tensile stress where you are obtaining the maximum tensile stress when you are pulling in the upward direction because the dead load the dead piston is waiting is at the at the bottom most portion when you are pulling in the upward direction the locations you see when you are when you are moving up this is the area where the maximum tensile stress will be acted upon so when you are pushing down this is the area where the maximum stress will be acted upon so when you are considering this thing you have to consider the entire weight of the rod otherwise you will not get the correct results in terms of stress aspect so the maximum tensile stress will be acted upon in this location and maximum uh, compressive stress during the downward stroke with the maximum compressive stress will be acted upon in this location see sigma x that is a maximum uh, load which is equal to maximum tensile load is equal to uh, which is equal to 160 plus 1000 because 160 is the resistor is the weight of the rod weight of the rod plus the resistance offered during the upward stroke is of 1000 which is equal to 1160 kg and what about the maximum tensile stress load divided by the area so normally p is replaced by the letter s here so s divided by the thing area <clears throat> and similarly the greatest compressive stress will occur at the lower end of the rod during the downward stroke because it at the bottom we are playing towards the away from the gravity that's you are adding the resistance but uh, towards the gravity that is weight is not a matter it is like a massless rod or massless string eh? so they have taken only the uh, resistance offered by the body and uh, this is of the resistance 100 divided by 2 which is equal to 50 kg per cm square if you are working away from the gravity then you have to take the weight of the rod when you are working towards the gravity that is no need of taking the g here that is a weight of the rod here so which is equal to the maximum the greatest compressive stress will occur at the lower end of the rod during the downward stroke for this condition s is equal to 100 kg compression so s divided by a 100 divided by 2 is equal to 50 okay sir so this is something about the shear stress we want to design the bolt uh, which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, which is buckling which, which is connected to this uh, um, <coughs> with this uh, which is connected to this joint uh, we want to design the t p is given in that problem the total p is equal to 8400 you want to find out what is the shear stress induced in this areas aa 
the tension rod made up of two parts are shown uh, shown in figure below is designed to carry a total load p is equal to 8400 it is of a tensile what is the proper diameter d for the connecting bolt if the allowable working stress in shear is t tau w is equal to 700 kg per centimeter square uh, i forgot to insist on one point here whenever you are talking about the working stress or the allowable stress the factor of safety plays a predominant role factor of safety is the ratio ratio of the ultimate tensile strength to the working stress of the material and ultimate tensile stress of the material to the working stress of the material factor of safety is equal to ultimate load or the ultimate stress divided by the working stress that is why you are indicating here what is the proper diameter d for the connecting bolt if the allowable working stress in shear tau w is equal to 700 kg per centimeter square the answer for this problem if you take you are taking out the two shear area if you consider only one area because it is called a double shear if there is a problem if the, if the load is exiting if the load is uh, exiting beyond the ultimate uh, load of the material our uh, it uh, beyond the ultimate tensile load then the fracture will happen the fracture is something about the shear failure shear failure will happen in this junction a a and here it is called double shear okay well, so you have to consider the two area and the area of the cross section assume that the bolt fits snugly in the holes through the prongs of the fork and that the clearance are small so that bending action on the bolt will be minimized see if there is a gap between the fork and the and the what is that that uh, that snugs uh, so if there is a gap uh, it leads to bending of the bolt so what do you assume here the uh, the uh, assume that the bolt fits snugly in the holes through the prongs of the fork and that the clearance are small so that bending action on the bolt will be minimized then the bolt is essentially in the condition of direct shear across the section aa so what is the area two area of cross section aa shear area is equal to 2a two area is equal to the load the maximum load divided by the working stress maximum load divided by the working stress so which is equal to load is of 8400 divided by 700 we are getting out the 12 square centimeter so that's the rocket cross section area of the a of the bolt is of 6 square centimeter that is of centimeter square 2 area is equal to 12 a is equal to 6 centimeter square and from that correspondingly you can find out the diameter pi by 4 d square from that you can design the diameter of the bolt clear as that for that you want to find out the shear stress and the load exerted in the body clear as that so whenever you are giving that we are after giving the information of the shear stress definition then you give this type of a problem then you can easily understand what do you mean by a single shear what do you mean by a double shear problem okay and uh, so i think uh, the, those who are uh, studying the strength of uh, subject strength of material subject are those who are uh, taking the strength of sub strength of material subject in their classes they are uh, aware of that uh, the deformation of a uniformly tapering rod that is well known thing that is clearly explained by uh, by uh, by all the authors of the strength of materials but uh, there are some typical problem this also raised by one of my students in the class uh, he raised sir what happened if you convert that uh, uniformly tapering circular lot as a cone what is the axial deformation because of its own weight you are not applying any load in that because of that own weight for example if you keep this cone for thousand years because of the own weight there may be some deformation assume that what we assume like a material is of isotropic and homogeneous if you assume that because of the self weight because of the own weight there is a deformation what is that equation what is the delta what is the value pertaining to the delta then i took this problem and i explained this problem in the class that i am sharing with you determine the deflection of a point deflection of a point a this a of a homogeneous circular cone of height h density rho density of the material is given and modulus of elasticity e because we are considering the material property due to its own weight that is a problem you want to find out the delta the beautiful thing pa the beautiful thing i am very interested to share this thing with you the same thing as far as the uniformly tapering rod you have to consider a small elemental ring at a distance of y from the point a so what is that the radius is something about the r capital r is the radius of the cone at the small r g that the height is totally of h so we are taking a small elemental ring at a distance of y from the point a 
and the elemental ring width is something about thickness is something about the sigma y what about the load you have to consider this entire weight uh, so consider a slice of thickness dy weight of a above slice that is of rho g density into gravity because one weight means you have to take the g value so rho g into one rho means it is of density kilogram per meter cube you have to multiply the volume volume above this slice what is that 1 by 3 cone volume what is that 1 by 3 volume of a cone 1 by 3 pi r square into y height is something about the y it is that load so you know that delta is equal to pl divided by ae so you want to find out because of this load what is that deformation happening to the small slice thickness of dy so d delta is the deformation pertaining to the slice thickness of dy so p dy divided by ea pl divided by ae pa pl divided by ae instead of l it is of dy because i want to find out what is the deformation happening to the dy d delta is the deformation so d delta is equal to p dy divided by ea p you already find out from the density as well as the volume multiplications so you substitute this value multiply with the g and the area is something about the area of the circle is now something about pi r square so rho g into volume divided by e pi r square so d rho g divided by 3 e y into dy this is for the small elemental thing if you want for the whole height h then you have to integrate the entire thing d delta integrate the d delta to becomes delta and the integrate limits must be zero to h from this point to the this point from this point to the this point so d delta is equal to rho g divided by 3 e y dy delta is equal to integrate with respect to zero to h rho g 3 e y dy so if you integrate y square divided by because y is varying from zero to h so if we integrate y with respect to dy so y square divided by 2 <laughs> substitute the upper limit and lower limit so delta is equal to rho g h square divided by 6a it is acting in the downward direction okay was it because you are keeping the base at the bottom if you keep it at the base in the top then the arrow head should be in the opposite side uh, opposite way but you are keeping the base at the bottom so the uh, deformation will be occur in the downward direction rho g h square divided by 6e so each notation is having its own meaning these are all the different problems it's a, see it's a another problem where it is very difficult to uh, get the solution for this problem the same method we can adapt the elemental ring but for this problem this will not work what is that so the ball is truncated and its end to support the bearing load p if the modulus of elasticity for the material is e determine the decrease in its height when the load is applied it is a, like a bearing load so now we are talking only with the axial deformations we are not considering anything about the lateral deformations or lateral contractions because we are talking only with the one dimensional not we are not dealing anything with the two dimensional when you go with the two dimensional i will explain about the poisson ratio but here you see the radius of this uh, uh, truncated ball is of r the locations at the where load is p is acting it's the radius of r by 2 you have to find out the solution for this problem please see my dear friends so what is the way we are attacking the problem see we are taking only that portions a free body diagram what is a free body diagram you know something about the radius r so it is something about a rotation of theta you have to find out the theta here and the theta varies from how to find out the theta varies from the solution for this problem you can this take it as a r radius it is converted into radial as well as the horizontal component what is the horizontal component it is of r sin theta because radius r theta this is of this is uh, r is something about the hypotenuse so this is something about the r sin theta and this is of r cos theta okay well, so it is resolved into horizontal as well as the vertical component now what i am going to do this r sin theta my dear friends please listen this r sin theta is equal to r by 2 then only you can find out what is that theta varies from location from one location to the other so if you equate r sin theta is equal to r by 2 r r will cancel therefore sin theta is equal to 1 by 2 then theta is equal to sin 30 degree so sin 30 degree is equal to pi by 6 okay was sir then you have to find out the lower limit we have achieved we have to find out the upper limit what is the upper limit r sin theta is equal to r if you put the upper limit 
so you have to get the radius up to here so r is equal to r, r sin theta is equal to r r all will cancel so we have one bar sin theta is one we are getting sin 90 is equal to one so it is of pi by 2 so then theta varies from pi by 6 to pi by 6 to pi by 2 so if we get one half then you can multiply into 2 to get the total deformation take one half then theta varies from pi by 6 to pi by 2 so you can achieve this portion once you achieve this portion you can find out the deformation of the upper part so this is symmetry so what are the deformations you are getting multiply into get into 2 to get the full deformation see delta is equal to 2 times of pi by 6 to pi by 2 pl divided by ea ea what do you mean by ea area what is that area here it is something about a circle pi r square pi into r sin theta the square pi by 2 pi pi, uh, pi into r sin theta the whole square where this one height is equal to what is that r of d theta la r of d theta means d of r cos theta see d of r cos theta minus p load is in the downward direction minus and it is also getting a minus therefore minus d into r cos theta so everything you are getting in the negative direction because it is suppressing this compressing load is compressing this radial direction is also compressed to get the radial deformations correct so minus d into theta d theta means it is of r cos theta if you differentiate of r cos theta you are getting Minus sin theta minus minus will become positive. So p d theta that sin theta will ca will ca the, the top uh, r sin theta will cancel the bottom r sin theta. So we have only r sin theta at the bottom. I repeat, d theta d theta is something here. It is of radial direction is of r r cos theta. Once you differentiate the r cos theta, it becomes minus minus. We have another minus will come because differentiate of cos theta is of Minus sin theta minus minus becomes positive. So d of d theta. So we have r sin theta at the top, r sin theta at the bottom cancel cancel. We have only r sin theta being at the bottom because it is of square. So d theta divided by e i r sin theta. So minus will will take out because of minus p will take minus out. So minus two p by pi r pi r e. So once you integrate, it becomes a natural logarithm. Log of cosecant theta minus cos theta, cot theta. So you have to integrate with respect to limits. Uh, pi by six to pi by two, substitute it and find out the value. This will be acting in the downward directions because it is of negative. So this is the deformations. Once you know the inch smallness of the material, once you know the radius, once you know the load bearing load, then you can easily find out the deformation of this truncated ball. So what is the idea we are uh, uh, applying here to find out the thing? you are considering what is the deformation what is the curve pattern what is the theta wow what is the limit between the theta from that you are finding out the deformation the equations what you are using is something about a very simple equation delta is equal to pl divided by ea okay so these are all some typical problem once you give this problem to the students then they rethink then they refresh themselves in such a way that Oh, these are all the problems. Practically, you can directly implement to the thing like that. They will tune themselves to get the practical exposures like that. I am. Uh, this is self-aid for a prismatic bar. So I will share the information to the then again you can get the things because we are running out of time. I want to give another important idea uh, with respect to the. So these are all very basic problem, uh, but some small small hitches in the problem. you have to carefully go through the problem for getting the solution of the problem okay now so far what we discussed with respect to the one dimensional and now we have to get into the poisson ratio so when you go for the poisson ratio it is discussing about the two dimensional problem when there is a when the tensile load is applied along the length of the beam uh, or length of the rod what happen the length of the rod will enhance at the same time there is a reduction in the diameter to correlate these deformations they are introducing a term called poisson ratio what do you mean by the poisson ratio is the ratio of transverse contraction strain to the longitudinal extraction strain in the direction of stretching forces see if you take any small bunzal and all those 
because they will take something about the lateral strain by the longitudinal strain. But here you see the words they are using give a more meaningful to that ratio. Transverse contractions because when you are applying a tensile load on the rod, there is an elongation. At the same time, there is a contraction at the diameter to give an information about the ratio. That is why they are giving transverse contraction strain to the longitudinal extension. In Timoshenko, it is mentioned with the unit lateral contraction divided by unit axial elongation. I repeat, in Timoshenko, if we could refer, the ratio, Poisson ratio definition is the ratio of unit lateral contractions divided by unit uh, axial elongation. What it means that, sir, along the length direction, it is of tensile where we have to consider a positive, but at the same time, there is a contraction in the uh, cross section. So we have to use a negative sign. So if you could refer, Poisson ratio it is denoted by a letter mu or 1 by m. If you take a mu, uh, which is equal to minus lateral strain divided by the longitudinal strain. If one is compressive, other should be of tensile. That other should be of compressive, this should be of a tensile. Okay, well, for most of them, why I am emphasizing here? From one dimensional, I am getting into the two dimensional. Sir, why I am purposely introducing this one? It's a small information uh, I am going to give to your friends, my dear, uh, to you, my dear friends. For most material, the value of Poisson ratios lies in the range of 0 to 0.5. You see, if you take elastomer, if you take a rubber, the Poisson ratio, that will be standard strain. If you take a ratio, it is of 0.5. Tell me a material, I, I am challenging you, my friend, my dear friends, sir. Tell me a material whose Poisson ratio is greater than 0.5. Theoretically, when the body, when the material is acted upon a tensile load, I repeat, tell me a material whose Poisson ratio is greater than 0.5, but the material should be acted upon with a tensile load along the length directions or with or width. One tensile load should be acted on under material. In that case, tell me a material, real material in the world where the Poisson ratio is more than 0.5. Theoretically, it is impossible, sir. I want to prove that if I am giving something impossible, then I want to give the proof for that uh, uh, poison ratio. See, if you could take that, uh, so I have derived something and I have take the screenshot and I have focused here. See, if this is the length, okay, wow, and this is the breadth, uh, this is the breadth. So when uh, when the load is acting on this body, see, when a tensile load is acting on this body, see, I will put the, uh, take the pointer, pin. so when the tensile load is acting here like this, this side. What will happen? There is an, there is an, uh, the law, the length of the rod is extended. So L dash is the uh, final length, which is equal to L plus delta L. At the same time, B is, there is a surplus, there is a contraction in the breadth, B plus delta B. Here I have used the delta B is less than zero. I am using the compressive strain. It is indicating that B minus delta B. Similarly, at the depth, depth is also D minus delta B. Or if you could take H, H minus delta B because these are all compressive. Uh, tensile along the length direction, but other two direction is only of compressive. That is the relation between the lateral to the longitudinal. So if you take the mu, what is the mu? It is of sigma Y by sigma X. Along the breadth, divided, lateral divided by the longitudinal. So sigma Y is equal to mu into the gross multiplications mu sigma y is equal to mu into epsilon x so y is perpendicular to x similarly z is also perpendicular to the x along the width direction along the depth direction so sigma x is equal to mu into epsilon x sir epsilon x what do you mean by that change in volume change in length divided by the original length delta l by l delta l is equal to epsilon x into l so what do you mean by that l plus delta b l is equal to l plus Instead of del L, I am multiplying, I am cross multiplying delta L is equal to L into epsilon X. So if you take L out, 1 plus epsilon X. So B minus, what is that? B plus delta B lab because it is compressive. We have to use a compressive. So we already made that yeah, epsilon Y is equal to my, which is equal to mu of epsilon X. So if you take delta B is equal to mu Y is equal to delta B by 
mu y is equal to delta b by delta b by b so delta b is equal to cross multiply delta b is equal to b b into epsilon y similarly if we take a h delta h is equal to uh, delta h is equal to h into epsilon z so if you put all those things here and if you take b out uh, 1 minus mu epsilon x similarly h plus delta h is equal to h minus mu of epsilon uh, x into h because every terms in terms of epsilon x i am converting so h into 1 minus mu epsilon x please carefully listen so these are all related everything i am converting in terms of epsilon x okay well. so what is that area initial area to the cross section initial is equal to b into h after applying the load it is change in cross sectional area b dash h dash what is the b dash here b dash is equal to b into 1 minus mu epsilon x h into 1 minus mu epsilon x if you multiply b h into 1 minus mu epsilon square so area final is equal to area initial into 1 minus mu epsilon the whole square i am converting epsilon x is equal to pure epsilon because epsilon is nothing but the strain whatever may be the strain i am correlating with respect to a small strain so x y is it i am converting in terms of everything in terms of the strain here so area initial bh is something about the area initial into 1 minus mu epsilon the whole square now what is the final volume final volume v final is equal to area final into l dash what is the area final area because it is already there area final is already available a into 1 minus mu epsilon the whole square l into l plus epsilon where you have achieved this is the equation l into l plus epsilon okay because it is of positive because there is an extension where it is elongated so al i am taking out al and 1 minus mu epsilon the whole square 1 plus epsilon if you expand it 1 minus mu epsilon into 1 minus mu epsilon and the epsilon itself is very small epsilon square is very very small i am neglecting that uh, like epsilon square so we have only 1 minus 2 mu epsilon into 1 plus epsilon so al 1 minus 2 mu epsilon into 1 plus epsilon here so al you multiply and once again epsilon square if you are attaining it is a very small value so i am equal to zero so the final equations what i am obtaining final volume v dash is equal to final volume v dash is equal to final volume v dash is equal to al into uh, al plus uh, al into 1 plus epsilon minus 2 mu epsilon so area initially is something about al area final is something about a final into l dash so if you take the change in volume delta v so al the same equation minus al so if you multiply al al will go one al will be go so if you take epsilon out al epsilon into 1 minus 2 mu what do you mean by the volumetric strain change in volume divided by the original volume so when the load is applied tensile load is applied on the body there is a change in volume then volumetric strain will be that so volumetric strain will be the change in volume divided by the original volume this is v dash so the delta v is equal to here and initial volume is of al al will be cancelled together and we have epsilon is equal to 1 minus 2 mu which is equal to delta v by v sir what is that mu if you put 1 by 2 if you put 1 by 2 that is a 0.5 what is the question i have raised if you put more than half the volumetric strain becomes negative how comes when a low tensile load is acting on the body how comes the volumetric strain will become negative so hence the thing is henceforth the theoretically speaking the poisson ratio will never ever exit 0.5 see if you put more than 0.5 for mu here the volumetric strain will be negative is it not this is not possible because what i have discussed what i told you previously when a volume when a material is act upon with the tensile load there is an elongation there is a change but it should not be a negative it should be a positive so theoretically speaking as far as this derivation is concerned if you put a mu value more than 0.5 it leads to it will lead to 
a negative value that is not possible. Hence, damn sure, theoretically speaking, the Poisson ratio will never ever exit 0.5. Okay. So, like that, uh, I have typical things. So, this is a relationship between the uh, two dimensional strain. So, I have so many things because strength of materials is like a ocean, it is like a Pacific Ocean. So, it is wider and deeper, covering all the part in depth. In, uh, however, it's very, very difficult. Uh, so, uh, uh, in addition to that, I have prepared a uh, uh, number of problems uh, because this problem, this problem itself, well, it's very, very difficult. This is like a gate question or it is like a reasoning question. So this problem and all I have discussed step by step here. I yesterday itself I have made an equation editor. It is not copied and pasted here. I have made all the derivations and I have made over here. So I will share all this information to Dinagran. You can get the uh, PPT from the Dinagran. Okay. So with this I am going to close because I have crossed around uh, my given limit. Uh, so extremely sorry for that. <coughs> Yes, sir. sir. Ah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Wonderful uh, basics. And uh, so, uh, certainly, this will induce their mind. They will enhance their uh, basic understanding. And this will help them to uh, go for a better teaching. And, uh, sir, we will take a few questions, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, Swapna, you can. Uh, okay, sir. The question is asked by Mr. Keshwan. Sir, can you please explain once again the differences between static indeterminate and static determinant? Okay. For example, uh, I, have, I, I have showcased the one schematic representation of a simply supported beam. It is not a simply supported beam. Uh, it is having two rollers. I think I uh, will go to the presentation. Uh, Ms. Thiba, you have been allowed to uh, come into live and to ask the questions. Uh, so if you come on live, uh, please mute your audio and wait. When you are allowed, you can you can ask the question to sir. See, uh, with this, uh, this is a schematic representation of uh, one statically indeterminate beam. See, we have hinged support at the point A, roller support at the point B and solar support at the point C. A yeah, vertical load is acting at the uh, on the B. So F is known to you. F is as a given as an input that is an uh, uh, loading condition, and your intention is to find out H A because it is a hinged support. You have a reaction, a uh, horizontal reaction at the hinged support. If you put a roller, then H A will not be there. So if you replace the hinged support with roller, there will not be any H A. But if it is a hinged support, H A will be there. And vertical reaction force at the point A, vertical reaction force at the point B, vertical reaction force at the point C. Totally, we have four unknown coefficients. See, in the beam construction on the right, the four unknown reactions are that VA, VB, VC, and HA. Okay, wow. but uh, as far as the static equilibrium equations, we have only translational equilibrium equations and rotational equilibrium equations what do you mean by translational summation of vector vectorial sum of forces horizontal and vertical we have two equations horizontal sum is equal to zero summation of horizontal forces is equal to zero one equation horizontal uh, sorry vertical sum of vertical component is equal to zero that is a second equation first simultaneous first equation h is equal to zero b is equal to zero and the third equation is what we have, rotational equilibrium equation, that is a moment. The sum of moment is equal to zero. So we have only three equations. My dear friends, my dear friend, we have only three equation and we have four unknown coefficients. It is resemblance, it is resembling. We have x, y, z, uh, x, y, z and h. We have four unknown, but we have only three uh, simultaneous equations. We have four unknown coefficient. If we have four unknown coefficient, means we have four simultaneous equation. We can solve the four simultaneous equation to find out the unknown coefficient. But we have only three simultaneous equations. What is the simultaneous equation? Vertical sum is equal to vertical sum of forces equal to zero. Horizontal sum of forces equal to zero. Moment is equal to zero. 
we have only three simultaneous equation but four unknown coefficient how is it possible to calculate the four unknown coefficient with the three simultaneous equation that is a problem that is why it is called statically indeterminate how to find out by using the deformation pattern what is the deformation pattern the so far what we discussed delta is equal to pl divided by ea e is something about the material property with the extra deformation pattern we can find out the reaction forces it's an example see here we have vertical sum is equal to zero we have derived this equation see yeah uh, what is the vertical forces here minus f 3 plus va plus vb plus v plus vc minus f equation number one okay wow. and second equation ha is equal to zero because there is no horizontal forces so ha is equal to zero if you have a vertical forces here if you apply a vertical force here then ha is equal to you can uh, equate the force but here is no ha there is no vertical uh, horizontal force sorry there is no horizontal force so ha is equal to zero that is the second equation and the third equation is what we have the moment equation if you take a moment with respect to a you are getting a three equation so this is the three equations we have but how many unknown coefficients are available here how many reactions are there four unknown coefficients four unknown reactions are there how is it possible with the three equations with the three equations how you can find out the four unknown reactions that is why it is called statically indeterminate how you are converting the statical indeterminate to the determinate if you remove the roller if you could remove the roller b then there is no vb there is no vb so vb you can remove it from the equation now four unknown reaction are converted to three unknown coefficient three unknown rea unknown reaction we have three uh, unknown here three no uh, three equations are that three equations three unknown you can easily find out so you can convert the statically indeterminate to a statically determined by suppressing the unknown reactions okay ma thank you thank you sir thank you dinagaran it is clear dinagaran yeah clear sir it is clear sir very clear sir okay thank you for your explanation sir the next question asked by mr dinesh kumar please explain the tangent modulus and secant modulus also sir uh tangent models and second models with the explanation i want to uh, with some example i want to explain uh, so you please note down my uh, mobile number i will come back to you huh? okay sir the next question from mr madhavan the strength can be found only by doing destructive testing no it is not like that because uh, nowadays we have so many ndt techniques are available from the chart from the given chart uh, for example if you take the concrete uh, especially for civil engineers they are not doing any type of destructive testing to ensure the compressive strength of the material they will use the rebound hammer number of uh, instruments are available non destructive instruments are available where they can use the non destructive instrument to measure to extract the mechanical strength of the material especially i think dinagaran may answer this question because if you want to find out the stresses induced in the body you can use the xrd or a drill hole method to find out the stresses induced in the body uh, by using different instruments there is no need of destructing the material and finding out the uh, finding out the properties of the material so many instruments are available in uh, in the modern days sir so you can use that instrument and you can find out the not exactly find out the mechanical strength but you can find out a tentative mechanical strength of the material yes sir well sir yes sir, yes, sir. uh sopna is there any question we want to go on question we will take okay sir the next question from mr murugan Sir, can you please explain when a material will fail? When the material will fail? No, thing is, uh, so everything will be working, uh, the material will work with respect to the molecular level. If the bond between the molecular 
is supposed to be broke, then automatically the material will fail. So, uh, especially when you go with this, uh, then uh, you, you, you can go with the tensile test of the material. See, uh, when you are exceeding the tensile, sir, when you when you are when you are exceeding the ultimate tensile load of the material, and if you release the load, nothing will happen. There is no nothing will happen in the molecular level. The bra the bond between the molecules will not in position to break themselves in such a way that it leads to the failure. Okay, ma. So you have to attack the material in terms of the molecular level for that you are using a different types of mechanical loadings okay well. so when you are using a different type of mechanical loadings when you are crossing the ultimate load if you are removing the load nothing will happen to the material level only there is a dependent deformation the material will not, not fail clear up so once you are exceeding that uh, uh, further if you are giving a load that load is having a tendency to attack in the molecular level, level and also it is in position to break the linkage between the molecules automatically the failure will happen yes sir sir thank you sir thank you so much and dinagaran uh, i that question what the question that is second modulus and tangent modulus i think sir uh, uh, second modulus and tangent modulus okay yeah. uh, so you please uh, i think uh, yeah, all the participants are having my mobile number my mobile number is 9443649278 so you ask that particular person to contact me i will explain in depth about the second okay. I, will, I will do it sir. and i i will uh, share the answer in the forum also sir. it's not okay. a matter okay. okay sir thank you thank you so much and uh, i got the message there sir this is the really fundamental fundamental setup we want so like that we got uh, so many uh, these things so many comments sir uh, thank you for the fundamentals and uh, uh, this will certainly will enhance your uh, uh, fundamental understanding and to get into uh, perfect classroom teaching and to get into the research and thank you so much sir once again and uh, i am very proud to be your, your student thank you so much we will meet on some other occasions sir thank you sir we will meet sir thank you thank you dinagar thank you friends uh thank you swapna uh, thank you and uh, dear participant thank you thank you for your uh, uh, these things uh, patience and uh, we, we have planned the session and uh, till uh, 11 am only so it has been extended up to 12 o'clock and almost one hour it has been extended and even though it was extended so this might be a great learning so the fundamentals so so again uh, i used to say uh, so i used to say to he he i am a student i, I used to say him often so i have learned a lot from you uh, but i didn't learn much more uh, about taking classes so i used to say him often so this is very uh, a wonderful experience so uh, he is a very good teacher and uh, hope you may also understood this so a very good learning from him and hope this will uh, further enhance your knowledge okay. so the next session will be started by 2 o'clock so it will be handled by dr g l samvel from iit madras so we will be handling on uh, manufacturing measurement manufacturing measurements and uh, and mostly the people those are coming and uh, uh, giving the expert lecture uh, uh, might have inspired me or uh, they might have might be a, a good teacher so the center for technology used to uh, call uh, Uh, that type of peoples uh, to share their experience to share the lectures and i hope the the forthcoming lecture also we will be uh, highly enhancing your fundamentals fundamentals and some fundamental understanding and will help you to uh, get into the perfect classroom teaching and the research and uh, please join by 150 uh, itself, itself and the link will be shared by 1:30 uh, pm and uh, so uh, i hope most of you have taken the yesterday uh, quiz of uh, engineering graphics and uh, and fundamentals of design and here also as like what we have done yesterday so evening we have quiz program so these uh, initiatives are uh, not uh, to uh, make into trouble so to uh, make this wonderful the uh, ftp uh, in a uh, in a valuable form valuable form 
as like other uh, government organizations are doing so that is the motto of this uh, 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 this initiative to make you to go for self study and uh, attend the qs and uh, as it was said earlier so this will be a really a wonderful uh, five days for the ever ftp which will make the certificate to be valid and can be verified by any accredited agency as i said the certificates and the list of participants will be available in our websites so any accredited agency is going going to verify that so that can be verified by uh, by uh, reading the uh, bar, uh, barcode of your particular certificate uh, in which your photograph and unique codes unique certificate number will also be available on that okay and yesterday uh, i have shared one uh, form for certificate and uploading photograph those who have not uploaded their photos and the details in the form you can upload again upload okay so those who have uploaded their these things information yesterday itself do do not need to worry and those who have not done can only do that and as it was uh, such earlier so few of you have um, uploaded uh, their uh, uh, information strongly even including the receipt of the uh, these things so that might have been Uh, done unknowingly since you might be uploading from mobiles so that is not a matter you can uh, correct that okay so thank you so much we will meet at 145 thank you